Today's episode is brought to you by Engineering.com, a globally trusted source for engineering content. Check out this and many other exclusive videos for the engineering professional found only on Engineering.com TV today. In the aerospace industry, conventional part making has always been constrained by existing manufacturing techniques. Additive manufacturing offers new opportunities for the aerospace industry, particularly in lightweighting. But the aerospace industry is also highly regulated and is safety critical. So how deeply into this industry can Additive go? I spoke with multiple experts at the recent Rapid TCT show in Los Angeles and they had some interesting insights. One long-standing issue is the expansion of Additive technology out of the power plant and into the airframe. It's a difficult challenge, but the potential rewards in mass savings and aerodynamic efficiency could be very large. Can we move, do you think, out of the hot section and into airframe structures or into flight control systems? As we look at where, where we can deploy additive within aerospace and commercial aviation in this case, what are, the, what are the challenges of the process, right? And some of that comes down to the qualification process, things like this. It's great if we can build a really complex component once, but ultimately, even low volume, we need to understand um, very distinctly what are the inputs of variance, how do, we, how do we control those things, how do we manage those things, and ultimately get to a point where we have the repeatability, the reliability that we have for most critical industries, such as commercial aviation. We'll start with secondary tertiary structures. Things like interior cabin structures even, you know, you have some really complex parts like what you see behind me, um, but you also have some really non-complex parts on an airplane that may be printed. So airframes and, and powder bed out of manufacturing might take a while for the size of parts. So maybe some DED applications or some, some maybe wire arc out of manufacturing side of things. Uh, we're starting to see even more on some maybe business jet side or your smaller kind of private aircraft really start to get into the, the powder bed fusion side of, of the house, generally with respect to size. It's really just a size play. Yeah, so with aerospace, you know, uh, obviously no one wants anything to go wrong with the plane, especially in flight. Um, so uh, each part that goes into that manufacturing process is extremely critical, whether it's a bracket or it's the wing, right? And so when it comes to additive, they're really looking for a few key things. That's going to be something with a high modulus capability, um, high impact strength, good durability, chemical resistance, including you know resistance to uh, things like olefin-based uh, products as well. Um, and then they're going to look for that flame retardancy uh, for a lot of those parts. So when it comes to aerospace, you're going to see applications primarily in the aircraft cabin, so interiors components, um, some bracketry and other metal components, um, and then a few use cases of additive on the external of aircraft, uh, but primarily on specialized aircraft. So when you're thinking 3D printing and additive, you're thinking uh, metal components for external and critical components, and then aircraft interiors. And then of course, you know, every manufacturer is looking for cost controls. So your uptime, your productivity, and a low scrap rate. And that's really where that marriage of incredible performance materials with a great machine that can deliver good parts time and time again is incredibly important. The seat brackets, the interior fitting components, things we can do in the galley, these sorts of things which are higher volume but with, with cheaper materials that need a lower price point. Is, it, is additive still a sweet spot for that basically or is it going to take a while before this stuff gets cheap enough to work into the cabin? I think that additive is not quite there yet from a high volume standpoint because aviation, no matter how think they are cost insensitive, when it comes to a larger volume of applications, they are, they are cost sensitive because at the end of the day you are replacing 6061 cast components. And if you compare the cost of 6061 with an additively manufactured, let's say, aluminum silicon 10 mag, one of the most common aluminum alloys, the price differences between them could be substantial. That can like kill the business case. So I think it would uh, be some time before we're able to break into a more commodity application space, if I say so. But I think we will eventually get there. We're coming to a point where application and technology is rapidly progressing, where we're not talking incremental changes to deposition rates with this technology. We are talking 2x, 3x, and 4x changes. And I think at the S-curve, if we're talking about, we're like right past the plateau and we're right to above to launch the next curve, where we think we can unlock that productivity. Additive technology can clearly produce parts and assemblies with the necessary strength, durability, and corrosion resistance to find applications almost anywhere in an aircraft. But the aerospace industry by necessity is controlled by government regulation and by the engineering conservatism necessary in design engineers that hold the lives of thousands in their hands. 
the regulatory issue will be a pacing factor. What's the recommendation at this point is that if you're developing a new part for 3D printing, do you look for a supplier that has prior certification experience with the FAA? Absolutely. You'd want to find someone who's AS9100 certified uh, to be your manufacturer. Um, and of course, if you're doing the manufacturing yourself, then you're going to be looking for materials that are certified, whether that be you know FAR or V0, uh, flame retardancy capabilities, certain mechanical performance and testing and validation that's associated with those mechanical or with those materials and their performance. Um, that's really what's going to be critical. Do we need a new type of regulatory regime, say at the FAA, that says say blanket approved specific additive processes to make this more cost effective? I think we have to work with the regulatory agencies in figuring out how can we do this. Because the materials we're replacing, mostly on the casting side, we know that additive is a lot stronger. It's a lot more durable. It's got defects that orders of magnitudes less than what you would find in a casting process. But somehow it's always an improve me era. And how do we get around that? And I think uh, that's something that we have to meet halfway and the regulatory agencies have to meet us halfway. But I think that dialogue still needs to happen. It hasn't happened yet. Aerospace today is about things that are both numerous and cheap to build and things that are expensive and very high performance. The war in Ukraine has accelerated interest in large numbers of mass-produced drones as reconnaissance platforms and ordnance carriers. Meanwhile, new materials and technologies are opening the door to hypersonics as a practical technology for both military and civilian use. The cost-performance challenges are the same, whether you're flying at 15 knots or 5,000. Well, we mentioned hypersonics, of course, it's, it's not just propulsion systems that operate at tremendous heat. Leading edges of, of wings and airframe structures, uh, these things operate at, at incandescent heat and are expected to do so in future applications for maybe an hour at a time, essentially. So are we going to see these kinds of refractory metals moving into the airframe proper rather than just in, say, the hot section of the engines? Yeah, absolutely. I, that, that, the, all of those leading edges, they're going to see much higher temperatures. I think that's where the industry is going to go eventually. Um, you see a lot of R&D work happening. In that in that realm, that you're seeing the primes really pushing that effort. They they know the need is there, and so the technology is catching up. Uh, I'd say pretty quickly. Are we going to see something with these refractory alloys? The kinds of things you're talking about, where we may end up with vehicles that can tolerate re-entry basically without the need for these either ablative or these heavy ceramic shields. Yeah, I think that I think that is definitely possible. You can see that 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 trend. Everybody's thinking how to you know, reusability. You see in industry, you see people launching and recovering, and, and all of those things happening. So I think that's going to be the trend. I think metal is you know these refractory metals. They're going to be a, a, a certainly a potential solution for that. With drones, unmanned aircraft, the certification qualification bar is much much lower for a new material and process for, for for drones, and that's what you see on the table here. And so basically, you can do all the testing and get various types of uh, structural components on drones that can accumulate many flight hours on it, and that gives you a database that then allow, allow you to graduate to maybe unmanned components that have structural bearing components on it. Is additive a natural place for that technology? Are you going to see, you know, you know, graphite dipoles blended into the resins, that kind of thing? So I think absolutely. And then coupled with the fact that you know additive manufacturing can actually make uh, very complex shaped structures uh, for the low observable worlds. And then you can basically, with certain types of processes, you can have certain types of additives that you can put into the material systems to help um, improve the performance uh, in the LO world. Now, uh, we've gone from, of uh, course, a world of military aircraft where they're increasingly complex, increasingly expensive, and production runs are shorter in number as a consequence. They're really pricey. We have a war in Europe right now which has shown exactly the opposite. Thousands of low-cost resin drones which are essentially disposable. Yep. So is, is that a shift that you see on the military side? Are we going to look at an aerospace world where the Pentagon no longer wants $35 billion strategic bombers? Now we want 10,000 of something we can shove out of the back of a C-130. That's the world we're living in this day. I think you're going to start to see the world of unmanned, whether it's air, ground, or sea, uh, for the reasons because if you lose them, you just replace them. You don't have to maintain them for the next 30 years and all the spare parts and logistics and rapid support that comes along with it. Drones, uh, unmanned UAS, UAV type applications are, are really you know, central for Stratasys. And we, we see a lot of this going, obviously driven by world events and things that are happening right now. But you know, the technology is just so well suited for the development and the production of unmanned platforms. We know that we can rapidly iterate. We know that we can scale quickly with them. 
Um, and you know, some of these drones are different types of drones, right? Some that are attributable that might be used for surveillance and reconnaissance, and it doesn't matter what happened to what happens to those. And so that's probably a different kind of category. And if we can build those out and scale them quickly. We have you know low volume manufacturing solutions that, that we can use. And so we're, we're excited about that as an industry. We think that that's really going to be a nice application. But then again, the other platforms that are more programmatic, that are doing more complex missions, you mentioned payload, offensive capabilities, defensive capabilities, things that are required there. So we have a lot of, a lot of pr our prior work that we've done on that. And we've got some great examples that are you know, working with some very key uh, manufacturers in the drone industry to develop and, and iterate and scale these products that are actually being sold to the Department of Defense, Ministry of Defense, and uh, being used globally right now. So we're excited about it, yeah. Now, it's historically, of course, um, um, reconnaissance, even when it, when it is granular, you have specialists. You train people, individuals, to operate drones, right. basically. We're seeing now in Europe, there's a war going on right now where, for the first time, we're seeing very low-cost uh, drone technology right. being operated by people who do not have extensive training right. in either reconnaissance or attack, basically. Are we looking at a future where we have even more drones than we have now, basically, but they are completely attributable? Where they, even for reconnaissance purposes, you send it up, you see what you want to see at that point, and then you just throw it away. Yeah, yeah, 100%. I mean, it's you're seeing that right now. and. It's interesting how you know local tactics will change the concepts of employment in the battle space, and so we're seeing that right now. And so, the DoD has got several programs that, that are that are targeted toward this, and, and Stratasys and the industry, really, frankly, are, are are very closely aligned with that. New aerospace sectors like drones that carry ordnance and cargo and flying taxis mean part making in volumes that are larger than the industry traditionally manufactures. And that means that additive part making has to offer production in volumes using similar methodologies to multi-axis CNC machining centers. But is the technology ready? If all additive equipment performs similarly, I think we would see a lot broader adoption, uh, not just in aerospace, but across all industries. And that's really something we're working hard at at Velo, is making sure that every machine that comes out of the factory produces the exact same result and gives you that ability to scale without an overburdensome qualification and certification process. Artificial intelligence is everywhere today, including in additive manufacturing. There is a role for AI capability in additive part making. Do individuals who want to adopt 3D printing for a production process, do they think about the software component as much as they think about the machine or the material? Yeah, no, I think it's software is definitely a core component. Like you said, hardware, material, software is is one that uh, ensures reliability and repeatability that is critical in aerospace industry. And it's sometimes overlooked, um, but um, I think the more uh, the industry focuses on applications and end-to-end -end use cases, we start seeing um, interest raise in terms of intelligent automation and how we can use artificial intelligence or better tools to make our processes more reliable. So what did we learn about aerospace applications at RAPID TCT 2024? For both the power plant and airframe communities, the focus is now less about can we make the part to can we make it cost effectively. Both materials and methods are now sufficiently characterized to make additive a go-to technology from the very origin of the design phase. But there's still plenty of work to be done on the regulatory side. The next few years are going to be very, very interesting. Well, that's it for this episode of Industry Insights and Trends. If you're interested in learning more about additive manufacturing in the automotive space, we have an extended version of this video found exclusively on engineering.com TV. Click on the link in the description below for additional in-depth interviews where you can discover more about the latest trends in industrial 3D printing from our subject matter experts. Thanks for watching.